Whether you're just starting your cybersecurity career or you've been in the industry and you're trying to move around, there are just certain questions that cyber recruiters have the answers to. How do you break into cybersecurity? How do you negotiate a salary? What jobs are hot right now? Well, we are going to be talking today in this episode with Joe Hudson, who is a focused cybersecurity recruiter. He is senior in the industry. He's talked to thousands of candidates and placed many of them in jobs. We're going to get the real answers to these questions, and we're going to do it right now. Stay with us. Hey, Joe, it's great to see you. Thanks for spending time with Simply Cyber. Happy Friday, Jerry. Uh, hey, top of the top of everyone's mind, the number one question you get all the time, how do I break into cybersecurity? What do you say to this question when candidates ask? I say, do not ask that question. That is a, a very generic, a very tough to understand question. It's almost impossible for me to understand even how to get back to them without trying to unpack a lot. So, you know, the first thing that I'll say is if you're going to, to be asking that question, you really want to understand, like, what are your goals? And if you don't have any goals, you need to be working towards getting some goals. And they can be very small goals, but it's actually just starting with some direction. You know, what are you interested in? Maybe make a list of a couple of things that you're interested in and you can actually start to investigate some of these things, watch some YouTube videos or whatnot. But you don't you don't come to the table with such a broad question and actually expect to get some great advice, in my opinion. To be honest, I don't know how to effectively answer it. So I think instead of saying, how do I break into cybersecurity, which, Jerry, that's the main question I get. I'm sure you get a lot of these questions. Um, and hey, how can you help me break in? It, it's so it's so broad. So I think retune that, you know, put some focus into, hey, here's what I've tried so far. Um, have you seen these things work before, Joe or Jerry or anybody that you're talking to? Um, and then really it's more like, hey, I'm looking to go this direction within cybersecurity. I'm looking to go the offensive route, the defensive route. I'm looking to go into risk management. You know, having a more fine-tuned question about a specific direction I mean, if I came, you know, if I went up to somebody and said, hey, how do I get to New York? It's like, well, I mean, New York State, New York City, you know, are you trying to get there quickly? Are you trying to get there, you know, at some point, you know, there, there's a lot of things that you can unpack about uh, how to break into cybersecurity. Just I wouldn't come to the table with that question. You have a very low ROI in getting someone probably to respond to you and to give you a valuable answer. That's really my answer for that question. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, I, I want to weigh in on this one because I do get this question all the time also. Right. Like if you found Joe or you found me, then chances are you you started doing a little bit of digging and, you know, dig a little bit more. Get like, like to you said, like I can't really help you because the the answer to this question is a question. When someone says, how do I break into cybersecurity? You answer with a question with, what do you want to do? Like it's, it's way too vague a question to be able to effectively give you anything actionable. So go join a discord server, attend some webinars, talk to people on LinkedIn, what, whatever, like get some exposure, yeah. get some understanding, do some Google searching on those terms that you found out, do some training, figure out what's interesting. Where are your pain points? What, what, you know, what is potential? Like, how do I break into cybersecurity in as a SOC analyst mm -hmm. that I can help you with that? H how do I break into cybersecurity without a college degree in the medical field? Or, or you know what I mean? Like, like, you've got to qualify this question beyond how do I break into cybersecurity? Joe, how, how can I identify if a role is remote? You know, we live in a COVID uh, post, you know, COVID world, basically, where remote work is hot. Uh, how do I identify if one is a remote and go a little bit further? What is the likelihood percentages, rough numbers of remote opportunities within cybersecurity? Yeah, no, that's great, Jerry. I think you and I were texting about this the other day and, you know, I, I've actually done uh, a lot of kind of up to the date research in it and it moves quickly, you know, and there's a lot of companies that I work with that their entire, you know, approach to remote work is changing or they don't even know the, in the meantime, assume Every job that you see online, unless it says on site is remote and even roles that say on site still might be remote flexible. What you have to understand is that HR oftentimes holds the, the rules and they control the posting that goes out. The manager might be off in Denver, you know, recruiting for a position that's in North Carolina. He goes, I don't care where this person sits. He'll hire or she will hire someone that's fully remote. HR has to post a job in a certain way. 
Also, on the flip side, there are certain states uh, that require if you post a job as remote, you actually have to put the salary in that particular posting. So if you say remote, you're tied to that. If you don't say remote, you don't actually have to post that. So you can't say remote without actually putting it in there because a person in that state would qualify as being able to go for that job. So they will actually put on site just to avoid having to put the salary. Many rules that don't say remote are fully remote. I think probably we're looking in the 60 to 70 percent range for a lot of security positions right now are at least fully remote or hybrid remote. Um, I will say on the flip side, if you're looking for a job, even if you want to work remotely, the higher likelihood of you getting that job can be tied to the location. If you're in a local area for a posting, they could be having uh, some discussions behind the scenes about we were maybe coming on site, not sure yet. But for now, if we can get somebody local, that would be great just in case we come back on site. So you actually probably have a better shot of getting some visibility on a role if you are local, even if the role ends up being remote. Are you seeing any percentages where, uh, you know, uh, SOC analyst type roles or pen tester type roles are more likely to be remote? Yes, both. Um, I think pen testers, though, have they, they've kind of taken control of that narrative. And I think the offset side has a little bit more control to, to be remote. I work with some directors and have even placed some directors that they kind of go on site, but they say, I know I'm going to have to hire remote because I'd rather get top tier talent than people inside just for the sake of it. Uh, SOC analysts, I mean, there's not a lot of SOCs that I work with that are on site at all right now. Um, they're hiring. I, I work with multiple clients that have not historically hired remotely at all. They're doing it fully. They found out over the last two years, oh, we we know how to do this. This is actually not as hard as we thought. And it ends up not being the managers. And so a lot of times right now, you can get grandfathered in. I would recommend, though, that uh, if it's a big deal to you, get it written in your contract. You know, because there are going to be companies that change their tune. And what will happen is they will actually come to you and say, hey, well, we'll offer to pay for you to relocate. But if you don't relocate, it's on you. And if you mm -hmm. quit, you don't get a severance. You don't you don't get any of the benefits that kind of come with with that kind of termination when really you're the one that quit. But you're sort of being forced out. Uh, so I would recommend trying to get that written into your contract. And if a company's not willing to write it into your contract, maybe that's a red flag. Maybe that's a sign you know, it's, it's something to take in, into consideration. What certifications will give you the best chance to get a job? Well, I think that goes back to the first question. You know, what do you want to do in cybersecurity? And it also comes down to maybe you shouldn't just assume certifications are the way to go. Um, certifications, we all know that they carry a lot of weight. We know that they're very expensive. We know that they can take a lot of time. And we also know that some of them look really shiny and they're kind of useless. Um, I think there's a lot of advocates out there for for getting certain experience. And then there's going to be some that honestly, they're going to hire off certifications because they don't know what they're looking for. Um, I would just say pull up 10 jobs that you actually have applied to recently or that you've identified are really good fits and see if there is a common certification listed on each one of those. That is the best, most foolproof way of understanding what clients are looking for. Because even if that certification is not necessarily going to help you in that job, we're talking about help you get a job. The first like step of getting a job is getting an interview and getting a call back. And oftentimes, we've talked about this many times, the people that are actually looking at your resume first, they're not the hiring manager. It's the HR or the talent acquisition. And oftentimes, what they're going off of is what's on that job description. So if a certification is on there, you know, that's, that's probably what they're going to be looking for. So I'm not the one that's going to advise somebody to go get certifications to get a job. But figure out what your lane is, figure out what the market is actually asking you for. You, we could talk about this, this question for another hour, you know, and, and chop it up by sections. But I'm not going to give any specific advice on a certification that you should go get. It really depends on, on the research you've done and, and kind of the lane you want to stay in. Yeah, it's also worth noting, you, you mentioned go look at the job postings, 10 of them, and see if there's a common cert. I, I'd argue, too, if you know kind of what the job is you want, say SOC analyst, not only look at the certs, but look at the uh, responsibilities and look look across them, maybe the tech stack, maybe um, yeah. the, the experience that you're expected to have. If there's commonality, there's an indicator that you could go get that in you know, practical skills, in training, in labs, whatever it is. Like you can you can see the finish line and then work your way back. So that's also another great uh, uh, method to approach that. 
So, Joe, how can I make my resume stand out then if I've, I've if I found the job? Right. I'm ready for the next step. How do I make my resume pop? Well, I think that I, I have this question so many times <laughs> in, in different forms. And, you know, I have people that have these like ideas in their head that there are these rules that you have to follow with a resume. Oh, I can't say that. That's it's not the place for it. Your resume is like your only shot to actually say things about yourself and try to introduce yourself to what, you know, in ways that you might not otherwise do it. Um, I think if you're constantly trying to find the perfect template or you're paying people a bunch of money to write your resume, especially if you're paying someone that doesn't know you or they don't understand your, like your profession, you're going to spend a lot of money to pay a stranger to tell your story about a skill set that they don't understand. That's first of all, don't do that. In my opinion, uh, I'll, I'll look at your resume if I need to. Uh, I might take that back here in a minute. I might have an inbox flooded here, but uh, at the same time, treat, treat your resume like an experiment. You need to pay attention to the outcome of the resume that you're sending in. Not a, not a data set of like 10. Don't, don't send your resume out to 10 jobs and be like, well, I got no response. This must not be the resume. You need probably a bigger data set than that, but pay attention to what you're trying. And that could mean something like, okay, well, my education inserts are at the bottom of my resume right now. I'm going to move it over to the top and just see if that makes a difference. Uh, it looks like I've, you know, I've, I've worked really hard to keep this to one page, but when I really look at the jobs on here, I've got three bullet points on each. I don't give a whole lot of details. Am I really fighting to get this down to one page for the sake of conciseness or am I kind of robbing myself of giving people the true story? You need to really be able to try some of these things, work with some other people too. talk to them and say, Hey, how'd you get that job? Like, would you mind sending me your resume? Can I take a look at your resume? Would you mind if I sort of copy the style of your resume? The main thing, you need to like your resume. You need to like the story it tells about you. And also, you need to be able to speak to everything that's on there. Whether it's, hey, these are my intermediate skills. You can be upfront about that. But you better be ready for every pitch. If it's on the resume, it's fair game. And you better be ready to talk about it. Because you, you could absolutely shoot yourself in the foot by putting something on there that you're not prepared to talk about. But I, I think in terms of it, just be prepared to move some things around, try a couple different things, but don't, don't feel like you need to always reinvent the wheel. So, you know, if we, if we do go to that next step, we get the resume through, we get an interview and get an offer letter. This is a tough one for a lot of people, including myself. How, how can I effectively negotiate salary without it being awkward? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, the benefit of working with a recruiter is it's actually our job to sort of do that for you. Um, I did have a gentleman interview yesterday. He was not expecting the, the leader of the company to ask him about salary, but he asked him point blank and he said, well, I'm looking for this. And he said it was a little awkward. Um, but if you're in the market and you're talking with recruiters, first thing to know, if you're working with a recruiter for a full-time job, very likely we are incentivized to get you more money. The higher it goes for you, the higher it goes for us. So the awkwardness of talking about salary with a full-time job with a recruiter, take that off the table. We want to get you a lot of money. On contract, the lower you go, the more goes in my pocket. <laughs> and that makes it an awkward conversation. You can actually take control of that conversation in a way to say, okay, it sounds like you guys have had some pretty good success placing people in these roles. What's been kind of the average range you know, of where people are getting placed? you'll often hear a recruiter flip it and go, well, what kind of range are you looking for? That's where you, I, I would not say what I'm looking for. I would say, well, the market values me at this by saying I've been contacted by a number of jobs ranging in between X and Y. My range is typically in that. And you're, I wouldn't say lie. I wouldn't say make it up, but you can absolutely just say what the market is valuing you at based on jobs that you're seeing coming in. And then you're saying, I'm targeting a range there. You need to know your minimum. You need to know, like, what do I need to pay the bills and keep my lights on? And then put a threshold that's above that that you feel is reasonable. And then keep it kind of aggressive. And that way, if you come up with a number that you know is probably out of your range and you're not going to get it, they may actually feel like they're getting a bargain, getting you at a number that's higher than the target that you actually have in mind. But I would flip it to say what the market is approaching you about as opposed to what you as an individual are looking for, because there are people out there that are worth $150,000. And right now they're getting paid a hundred because they haven't left their company in five years or, you know, they just haven't looked and they haven't taken advantage of the hotness of the market. 
So I know I said top five questions, but I want to throw a bonus question out here, Joe. Right now, 2022, what is hot in cybersecurity right now in the job market? Yeah, I think we all know how how quickly this moves. I'll kind of pause there for a second. I was just thinking about this a second ago um, for Easter uh, a couple years ago, my son, we went to an Easter egg hunt and there was like a hundred kids out there and they all had their baskets and they were ready to rock. And, uh, I said, Hey man, his, his name is Jovi. He's Joe the fifth. Uh, I said, Jovi, I want you to sprint to the back of that field. He's like, why? I said, all these kids are going to be right here trying to scoop up all these eggs. Just, just go to the back. Nobody's going to be back there. And within five minutes, this kid's like, you know, coming back with his, his basket all full and you got all these other little kids like fighting over eggs. Uh, my point is, if you can catch what's really hot right now, like if you're trying to break into to security, you probably have a better shot of getting a crack at something if you've got today's hot skill, hot talent versus I've got 20 years of catch up to do, you know, with the old school kind of methodology. Um, obviously, if we're going to talk about specific topics, we all know cloud is a great place to go. Everybody's using cloud. It doesn't matter if you're offensive security, defensive security risk assessments, leadership at the very bottom, everybody's doing something with cloud. We know that application security in many forms, whether you are uh, coming through the developer ranks and you're moving in to security, huge push in there. The quote, you know, shift left and trying to move security earlier in the development phase. If, you, if you're in development and you're curious about security, t- take advantage of it. You can make a lot of money right now just sort of putting some security into your daily processes. Um, But then also from an application security standpoint, you've got pen testing. I think the biggest gap in pen testing in terms of like the broad, you know, the whole market is on the application side and being able to sort of manually test some of these, not just relying on the tools, which that's a skill you can you can learn more about code and you can learn more about OWASP and different vulnerabilities easier than you can get access, I think, to a lot of these industry standard tools unless you, you know, you've got the access to them. But we know cloud, we know application security, uh, containerization. It's all kind of falls into the same thing. If I actually had to tell you though, where I think the next two years is access management, identity access management mm-hmm. is finally getting its dues. In my opinion, I'm seeing quite a spike in requests for jobs for that. We're talking privilege access management. We're talking all kinds of different tools, um, single sign on multi-factor, the acronyms could go on forever. Uh, but I am seeing a huge push for access management. So if you're a systems administrator right now and you're, you're pondering kind of making that move into cybersecurity, that, that, that right there, you know, those, those could be your keys. Nice. So thank you so much to Joe Hudson. That was amazing information. I hope you took a lot of action items away, got the questions that you have answered and absolutely dominated. If you want more Joe Hudson, check out this video right here where Joe and I talked for an hour and a half about how to make your resume absolutely awesome. He talked a little bit about resume. This is an hour and a half of him digging in deep and doing reviews and such like that. And then also, if you want to break into cybersecurity, this video right here is my absolute most popular video on the channel, how to break into cybersecurity with no experience. Until next time, stay secure.